So in one of my Substack posts today, I am going into the concept of multiple ontologies and multiple sources of truth. And so I want to build out this YouTube video as sort of a support to that Substack post for anyone that wants to go deep into understanding this concept of multiple ontologies. So first things first, what is an ontology? It's a way of arranging and organizing knowledge. When you have massive data sets and millions, sometimes billions of different data points, those data points represent something with respect to our world, with respect to our knowledge. And so when we, when we are learning as children, we're creating ontologies, which is a categorization system for all of this knowledge to put knowledge into context with each other because no piece of knowledge exists in a vacuum. And so that's the purpose of an ontology. Now, how does it do that? It creates this concept graph. That's a great way to look at it. Any given concept could be related to a number of other concepts and be completely unrelated to another set of concepts. And it's important for us as people to organize knowledge in our brain. And this is really how we create some sort of connectivity between all of these experiences that we go through on a daily basis. And it's how we create more complex informational concepts, more complex pattern recognition. Anything that you do that's mathematical is really a result of you having an ontology and being able to understand how all of this body of math that you've learned relates to each other so that you know when to apply what tools, what pieces of learning, what parts of the knowledge graph that's in your head to any given equation. And so let's think about this practically in real world. So what's an ontology? A good example of an ontology comes to us from biology. If you think about animals, animals need to have some arrangement, which is a taxonomy. You have a species, you have individual members of that species, and so you have this taxonomy, which is a hierarchy. It's a, an extension of ontologies. It's probably something you're pretty familiar with. And so we have these taxonomies that tell us how these types of animals are related to each other by creating a hierarchy. But ontologies are even more complex than that. They can contain more complex data structures, more complex concept graphs. Think about, does a cow eat grass? Yes. Does a cow eat sushi? No, not usually. Would they? Well, who knows? Maybe. But that's not something that's commonly associated. So when it comes to food, cow is most closely associated with grass. Horses eat hay. That, that's a factual connection. If you look at other factual connections that could be represented in ontology, force equals mass times acceleration. Those concepts are related to each other and that equation gives us the relationship. It gives us an ontology to understand how force, mass, and acceleration are all related to each other. PV equals NRT. Again, that's in and of itself. It contains ontological information. There is an entire field of natural language which is concerned with creating causal ontologies, causal relationships, and extracting those causal relationships. It's an offshoot of entity recognition that's kind of come into its own. It's almost its own type of entity recognition, but breaking off into its own type of text analysis, creating these causal graphs, the information at a causal level, and pulling that out of text. And so it's a type of natural language understanding, and you can tell how powerful that is. These are self-created ontologies where you read through a body of text and you extract these causal relationships and then create a graph of causal concepts where one concept, one data point, one feature, whatever you want to sort of dive down into, where one or a set causes a particular outcome or has some causal relationship to some particular outcome. And again, you, you look at biology, chemistry, physics, any of the hard sciences, these are all fairly well agreed upon facts. However, what happens in novel research, research which has not been rigorously proven, rigorously reviewed, rigorously uh, tested, 
And we have new theories that come out that are proven out in the paper. However, they have not been rigorously validated by the rest of the academic community for that particular field. And so is that a fact? Is that a reliable source for a causal relationship mining effort? Should we trust it? And this concept now spins out into what I'm talking about in my Substack post, which is multiple sources of truth, multiple ontologies. Now, what's an example of multiple ontologies? I don't want to go theoretically into physics or any of the things that may or may not be proven. So let's go into something far simpler. Let's talk about a vegetarian's ontology versus a vegan's ontology. Now, remember, when we talked about animals. We talked about how horses eat hay, cows eat grass. These are facts, hard facts. However, people are a little more complicated when it comes to our diets. I eat meat. Therefore, in my ontology, meat is food. Those are, that's a relationship. However, think about a vegetarian. In their ontology, meat is not food. Think about the next step. Let's take it a little bit further. A vegan, meat is not food. And they have even more restrictive dietary ontologies where there is an entire range of foods which I will eat, which they will not. Now, vegans are bombarded by uh, online. Think about it. They're bombarded by content from my, the majority, ontology. However, their ontology is perfectly accepted. It's nothing, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with being a vegetarian. There's nothing wrong with being a carnivore. There's nothing wrong with being a vegan or being gluten-free. There's nothing wrong with any of these. But you can start feeling persecuted. You can start feeling like the world is stacked up against you if the majority of content that you're shown has a conflicting ontology. And so vegans, you, you hear them, and this is echoed in the programming world where we are fairly tribal when it comes to our programming language preference. You get somebody who loves R versus somebody who loves Python. If you want to sort of radicalize them towards their programming language, spend a month serving them content about the opposing not saying that it's better than R, not saying Python's better than R or R is better than Python. Just sh serve them and show them a ton of content about their opposite, their polar opposite programming language, and you will radicalize them around their preferred programming language more times than you will convert them. They will feel like they are being in some ways threatened. Their belief system, their ontology is being threatened. Why? Because they are being shown content from a different ontology. Vegans many times feel exactly the same way. They're very vocal about the vegan lifestyle and how in many cases they feel the other lifestyle is wrong. And this is one of the impacts of conflicting ontologies when someone like me, who is a carnivore, is in the majority. And so the majority of ontologies, uh, the majority of content conforms to my ontology. So if you're a vegan, it's very likely that you will be served an ad for a steakhouse. That to you is, that's not okay. For you, that conflicts, that ontology conflicts with yours. And the more steakhouses I show you, the more posts I show you on any given social media where somebody's eating meat or preparing meat, that is showing you a conflicting ontology. And after a while, it feels like from your perspective as a vegan or from your perspective as somebody who loves Python or somebody who loves R, it almost feels like you're being persecuted. It is that perception. And so this is the important concept of multiple conflicting ontologies. That's what I talk about in my Substack post is you can radicalize people around their ontology, not by saying there's anything wrong with their ontology, but by simply showing them a majority of content that is from a conflicting ontology, an ontology which overlaps, but also contains major disagreements. And this is where we come into the concept of multiple sources of truth being represented by different ontologies. And one of the most important things for the online content moderation space, and this actually extends throughout any sort of knowledge graphing or knowledge gathering is a concept of 
the body of knowledge that you're mining has a built-in dominant ontology and it has usually multiple minority ontologies. And each one of those needs to be extracted out from each other. And each ontology being represented by the viewer, by the person who's interacting with your model or interacting with your data, that ontology not only needs to be understood, but respected. And the content that's shown to them needs to be, in order to not radicalize them, to not upset them or offend them, and there's any number of negative consequences by showing someone a conflicting ontology over and over again, a dominant ontology, but like me being a carnivore, there is a significant negative impact for me to continue to showcase you ads if you are not a carnivore for a steakhouse or for a cheeseburger joint or any of those types of ads. And you're, you're listening to this and realizing there are a number of very benign cases where multiple ontologies are accepted, widely accepted and widely offended <laughs> at the same time. Because number one, when we mine content, we do not mine it within the context of multiple ontologies. And when we serve content, when we interact with people, when we use our model, throw our model out there, and it has a dominant ontology in the training data, and we don't understand the bias that that dominant ontology introduces to our model. And we don't also then study the, the implications of serving content or serving anything really, serving any sort of inference from a dominant ontology to someone with a minority ontology. And this concept of mixing ontologies in the training data and the impact on a single aggregate model is sometimes erratic. It causes unstable, unpredictable behavior in our models. And as a consumer of information or as a consumer of inference, more generally, if mine is a minority ontology, you can cause some pretty big damage to me. You can cause me to get upset, offended, or any number of different negative impacts of serving inference from a dominant ontology to a minority ontology. And so we have to have this, number one, you have to understand what an ontology is. And you have to also understand that many of your models are building ontologies into them when they are mining these massive data sets, usually very unstructured, massive data sets. That can be text, that can be images. I mean, think about image recognition systems and how they handle different skin tones, different lighting conditions. All of those have led to some pretty negative impacts to minority ontologies, people possessing some characteristic which is connected for them to different types of information, different concepts, which causes a minority concept graph. However, they are being subjected to the majority concept graph. Their inference is served to them based on that majority ontology. And that has negative impacts for them. And, you know, in autonomous driving, this has led to some accidents, some issues with pedestrian identification. So there are a number of negative impacts that come from Number one, not understanding ontologies, not understanding the ontologies in our data sets, but then also not understanding how that translates to model behavior and how models interacting with people can cause unstable outcomes based on conflicting ontologies. And like I said, a lot of these are benign. The, the vegetarian example is the majority, I'll be honest, the majority of conflicting ontologies are very much like that, where you look at the ontology itself and you say that is completely valid. However, we don't think it out. And so as a result, we do some negative things to people in serving inference. So it's important to understand this concept of ontologies, this concept of knowledge graphs, to be aware of how our models build knowledge graphs and to incorporate multiple models which respect and represent multiple ontologies. And now we have to gather somebody else's ontology to understand how to serve them inference appropriately, how to pick the right model and serve them a complementary ontology, serve them inference built on a complementary ontology. This is where things get difficult because that requires us to understand a lot about the person. That requires collection of personal information. Maybe somebody doesn't want to tell me 
that they're vegetarian or vegan or a carnivore. Maybe there's something else, and I'm not going to get into the more controversial ontologies, but there are many ontologies that people do not want to share. They do not want to share the type of information necessary to build the ontology. And so we have to come up with privacy-preserving ways of serving the correct ontology to a user anonymously, where that user is not connected in any way to their ontology. And we are not gathering an invasive set of data about them, which violates their privacy. And this has a number of implications. You know, ad serving is the one that I use most frequently because I don't want to serve an ad to someone who has a conflicting ontology. I don't want to do that. If you are not someone who ever wears t-shirts, if t-shirts do not equal clothing for you in your ontology, and this is a minority ontology, I'm wearing a t-shirt. And so in my ontology, t-shirt equals clothing and it's clothing I'd wear outside of the house. But there are people that don't ever wear t-shirts. They feel they're too informal. Their ontology is different to me. So I don't want to serve them an ad for a t-shirt. If I keep sending them ads for t-shirts, I'm going to radicalize them around their view of other things being clothing. I'm not going to persuade them to start wearing t-shirts in the overwhelming majority of cases. And so I've alienated a customer. I have created a negative perception because I continue to serve them content from a conflicting ontology. So I have to resolve this, but I have to do that in such a way that I don't violate their privacy. I mean, I'm not going to ask everyone that comes to my website, Hey, do you think t-shirts are? And so we gather data. We find out about their shopping habits, their browsing habits. And so in many cases, this attempt to understand their ontology leads to invasive data gathering out of necessity. We're not trying to be evil. We want to serve them stuff that's relevant to them, whether that's content or ads or any number of information pathways that rely on ontologies, whether obviously or discreetly. And we have this problem in data science where we, we have to balance gathering too much data and on the other side, serving offensive ads, serving offensive materials to a person. So we want to be personalized and relevant while at the same time respecting their privacy. And so this concept of ontologies is a better way to think about it. And once you understand multiple ontology, sort of theory, I guess, once you understand the concept of multiple ontologies and multiple conflicting ontologies, we can begin to think of solutions for respecting everyone's ontology and serving content that's relevant to their ontology. Now, does this have its own dangers? Well, yes. If someone only ever sees content they agree with, we know some problems can arise from that. If their source of truth, if their ontology contains misinformation, that's well, dangerous because they can be making decisions which have grave consequences based on for lack of a better term, lies. What if we give you bad information about a particular food choice, which is healthy for you? What if we tell you vitamin C kills? We know it doesn't. But if I serve you something that aligns with your ontology and your ontology contains a false belief, not consuming enough vitamin C has health consequences. You know, vitamin D is the same way. I had a vitamin D deficiency at some point because I didn't go outside enough. So, and if I were served only content that said, hey, don't worry about vitamin D, I would have continued with that deficiency and I would have had negative health consequences. And so there's a danger there of only serving people information that aligns with their ontology. However, if we want them to not go down the path of radicalization around their particular ontology, we cannot continue to bombard them with a majority ontology because that's the impact of it. It radicalizes people around their beliefs because many times they feel like their beliefs are being persecuted. And so radicalization is a dangerous implication. However, siloed thinking is also a dangerous implication. And now we have these privacy implications to go with it. It's a complex landscape that we live in. And we often don't think all the way through our problems. But now 
With this perspective of multiple ontologies and often multiple conflicting ontologies and the, nece the necessity to reconcile multiple conflicting ontologies from a behavioral standpoint and from a privacy preservation standpoint, it, it's complicated, isn't it? But now that you understand it a little bit better, you'll be able to come up with frameworks on your own that will resolve some of these challenges. And so that's really the deep dive into what I was talking about in my Substack post when I made reference to multiple sources of truth and conflicting ontologies.